Well, do open your Bibles, please, to the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43, and we're just going to read the first four verses. But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you, I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for giving us your word. And we pray now, for a special measure of your Holy Spirit to come and rest upon us and help us to understand. May we hear your voice speaking to us. Please take away any distractions, anything in me, anything outside, anything in the week ahead or the week past. Uh, Remove it from us and help us to uh, fix our eyes on you and on our Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, this morning we're coming back once again uh, to this wonderful Old Testament uh, prophecy. Um, perhaps you might be able to figure out what my favorite Old Testament prophet, or rather who my favorite Old, Old Testament prophet is. But just to refresh your, your memories from, from the last time, let me give you some very brief uh, background information. If you turn all the way back to the very first chapter and the first verse of this book, you'll see the author um, and some information about the date when, when this prophecy was written down. So the first verse says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So the author then is Isaiah, son of Amos, and he lived and ministered in Jerusalem, in the city and in the surrounding areas. And really Isaiah's main concern, his his heartbeat, if you like, is, is the glory and majesty and splendor of God. And so he's not really too concerned uh, about giving much by way of personal uh, biographic information. We do know um, roughly the, the year in which he was called uh, to ministry. We see that in chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died. That was around 739 BC. And he, he carried on ministering for just over 50 years uh, until around 600 and 86 BC. And Isaiah um, is one of the most, if not the most, expressive uh, prophets in the whole Bible. He uses a a wonderful range of language to express God's message to his people. And again, just in the the few verses before us this morning, we've got some vivid uh, picture language. Floods, waters, rivers, uh, fire, flames, We've got the, the wonderful, beautiful ideas of redemption and ransom, of preciousness and love. And so the whole prophecy is like, a, like an intricate tapestry that weaves together poetry and song and history and theology to form a masterpiece that, that just beckons us to explore 
the wonders of God's plan for his people. Isaiah can be divided up and, and outlined in various different ways. One way that I found helpful to think of is uh, to think of it as containing three books, if you like. Uh, so chapters 1 through 35 form the first book, and we could call that book the book of judgment. Verse 4 of chapter 1 sums up the charges against Israel. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. And then there's a sort of historical interlude, the second book, uh, the book of Hezekiah, chapters 36 to 39. That records some of the history of the, the reign of Hezekiah, the invasion of the Assyrians under King Sennacherib, God's deliverance of Jerusalem, Hezekiah's illness and his recovery, and then Hezekiah's fatal mistake in showing all the treasures to envoys from Babylon. And then the third and final book is the book of comfort. And that's where we are today, chapters 40 to 66. And if you just turn back to chapter 40, you'll see this book of comfort begins with beautiful words. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. And so in this book, peace, peace for God's people is promised. And ultimately that comes through the prince of peace, the one that Isaiah calls the servant of the Lord. And it's, it's a message of comfort that I, that I want to bring to you this morning. So coming back to, to our chapter, you'll notice that the section we read together begins with, but now, but now. And this really ties it back to uh, the chapter that comes before, chapter 42. Isaiah there reminds Israel of their stony-hearted rebellion against Almighty God. Verse 24, they, they would not walk in God's ways. And even though they, they felt the fierce wrath of God, they were stubborn and would not take to heart what God was teaching them. So he poured on them the heat of his anger and the might of battle. It set him on fire all around, but he did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart. And so you'd think it would follow that God would, would just utterly abandon them and destroy them. But no, we have that that wonderful little word, but. And here the, the mercy and grace of God shines out. Matthew Henry comments here, he says, Now the sun, breaking out, thus of a sudden, from behind a thick and dark cloud, shines the brighter and with a pleasing surprise. The expressions of God's favor and goodwill to his people are very high, and speak abundance of comfort to all the spiritual seed of upright Jacob and praying Israel. For to us is this gospel preached, as well as those that were captives in Babylon. And so we're reminded here wonderfully of the truth of Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, that, that God's ways are not our ways, that his thoughts are not our thoughts. Jesus told a parable, didn't he, that captures really the heartbeat of this truth. We often call it the, the parable of the prodigal son. So a son uh, of a wealthy father demands his inheritance early and, and he runs away and wastes it on riotous living, on, on drink and whores and parties. And soon he's, he's spent all that he has and he finds himself feeding pigs of all animals, so hungry that he's contemplating even eating the, the pig food. And as he's there in this filth and squalor, he comes to his senses and he realizes that even the servants in his father's house are treated better than this. And so he decides to, to return, to go back to his father and ask if he can live in his house again, not, not as a son, but as a as a servant. And in verse 20 of, of Luke chapter 15, 
we have these astonishing words. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The father runs to his wayward son. And this is the truly standout, shocking part of the story. See, fathers did not run in those days. It was not the proper thing for the patriarch to do. And this is where we see the shocking mercy that God has for his people. Perhaps we should call this parable the parable of the running father. And instead of treating his son the way that his sin deserves, he has compassion on him. He embraces him. He throws a huge party for him. He puts new clothes on his son and a a ring on his finger. So why does the father behave like this? Well, because this father is a wonderful, beautiful picture of our heavenly father. The one whose ways are not our ways. The one whose thoughts are not our thoughts. This God is an infinite ocean of mercy. He's the one who rejoices before the angels when a single sinner repents. He's the one who the prophet Zephaniah says will rejoice over you with gladness. He'll quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. So when you go to him, having messed up again, having sinned in the same way again, needing his forgiveness again, needing to be cleaned up and washed again, well, he receives you with gladness. He rejoices to hear you repent. Boys and girls, how big is God? How big is God? What do you think? Well, it's a kind of a it's kind of a trick question, isn't it? Because God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. There's nowhere that you can go that God isn't. So God is big. He, he's bigger than we can possibly understand. But you know, you know what? The Bible tells us that this enormous, huge, vast God is full of mercy and compassion. How much mercy is that if God is infinite? If there's nowhere you can go where he isn't, How much mercy does he have? Well, he has infinite, everlasting mercy. And this this is the God who speaks to us in our passage this morning. He's the one with the message of comfort for our souls. He is the one who says to us this morning, Fear not. Fear not. Aren't they the words that we so often need to hear. Fear is perhaps the strongest human emotion. It can leave us utterly uh, paralyzed. It can prevent us from from doing the things that we know we should do. It it can drive us to do the things we we know we shouldn't do. It stops us from, from thinking clearly. It causes us to doubt the things we thought were true and to believe the things we thought were lies. But this morning, I want us to see three certainties from this passage that can act as an antidote to our fear. So first, the certainty of redemption, then the certainty of trial, and third, the certainty of God's love. But before we come to to our first point, I just want to answer very briefly an objection that might be raised at this point. Someone might say to you, Someone might say to me, why are you taking words that were spoken by an Old Testament prophet to Israel and transplanting them thousands of years to us now here in the 21st century? In other words, what grounds do you have for taking promises that were made to Israel as our own? We've only got time to consider a very brief answer, but put very simply, the church can claim these promises because she is in Christ, because she's united to him. The one who is 
the, the promised seed, the one who is the ultimate true Israel. In the Old Testament, Abraham stands as the, the covenant head of the people to whom God reveals himself. And crucially, his promise of redemption is, is revealed to Abraham. It's given to Abraham. And the New Testament authors uh, home in on the fact that God gave these promises to Abraham and to his seed. And the Apostle Paul goes a step further by suggesting that Jesus Christ is the seed, singular, to whom God was referring when he made those covenant promises with Abraham. So in Galatians 3, 16, uh, Paul writes, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. So God gave these promises to Abraham so that they might be passed down to Jesus Christ, who would, in the fullness of time, fulfill them all in his person and by his work. And so that's why Paul can write again in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, all the promises of God find their yes in him, in Jesus Christ. And so when we read of these glorious promises of restoration that God gives to Israel through the Old Testament prophets, then we have to do that through the lens of the person and work of Jesus Christ. All of the judgment that's prophesied about the nation prepares us for the judgment that fell on Christ, the true Israel, for our sin. And in his resurrection, Jesus secures the restoration that was promised so long ago. It's all about Jesus, you see. The, the text of Scripture is not Israel-ocentric, it's Christocentric. Jesus himself said this, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. There's a lot more that could be said, but, but I hope that goes at least some of the way to answering that objection. And if you'd like to know more, I'm sure um, one of our elders will be delighted to speak with you afterwards. Or you can even uh, see me. But here's the point. Jesus Christ is the true Israel, and his church is united to him through faith. And because of that, we can be confident that the promises of redemption and hope made in the Old Testament are ours in Christ. So let's go to our first point then, the certainty of redemption. Look at verse 1. God is speaking and he says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name, you are mine. What does it mean to be redeemed? The Hebrew word is, is ga'al. Uh, it's a, a word that's often used to describe the action of a kinsman redeemer. So think back to the, the story of Ruth and Boaz. Boaz there is the kinsman redeemer and he rescues Ruth from her poverty and provides for her and for Naomi. But here, in, in our passage, it conveys this sense of rescue, but a rescue from, from bondage, a rescue from slavery, a rescue even from death. In the ancient world, if you were captured by an enemy and made a hostage, then it would sometimes be possible for, uh, for, for your family to, to pay a ransom and they would be able to redeem you. Same if you found yourself in slavery through debt or whatever it might be. Sometimes it's even possible for, for a slave to save up enough money to buy his own freedom to, to redeem himself. There was another Old Testament prophet who gave us a, a vivid, living a picture of this. Hosea, he was a, a contemporary of Isaiah. He ministered uh, around the same time and, and God instructed Hosea to marry a prostitute, which... He did, a, a woman called Goma. And this woman bore him three children, but then she ran away. And she ended up enslaved. And God eventually tells Hosea to go and reclaim his wife, to redeem 
his wife. And so we read in Hosea chapter 3 and verse 2, So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. He paid the ransom price to release her from whoever owned her so that they could live together again as husband and wife. And this, this picture was meant to be shocking. Because Gomer pictured the people of Israel who had been unfaithful to God, forsaking him and whoring after other idols. Hosea's faithful love of Gomer was an illustration of God's faithfulness to wayward Israel. Just as Gomer had been unfaithful to her husband and had to be redeemed, Israel needed God's initiative to restore their relationship. So then the question is, what do we need redeeming from? What do we need redeeming from? Well, the, the answer is simple, but, but deadly. We are all of us, every one of us, born enslaved to sin. Jesus puts it like this, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. He was the only one without sin. Every other person who's ever lived before him, will ever live after him, makes a practice of sinning. We are slaves to sin. We're enslaved, not just to sin, but to the consequences of sin. We're enslaved to death. The, the wages of sin is death. The Bible tells us in, in Romans 6, from the moment we're born, we're drawn inexorably to our doom. We, we can't escape it. Death is coming for all of us. Left to ourselves, all we are capable of is various kinds and degrees of sin. Left to ourselves, all we would reap are the wages of sin, which is death. This is how Paul puts it in Ephesians 2. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world and following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But you know, perhaps the most devastating thing about this slavery, about this condition we have outside of Christ, is that this slavery is a willing slavery. It's not like we, we sin, but we really don't want to. No, we, we always do what we want to do. What we want most to do is what we'll do. And what we want most in our natural state outside of Jesus Christ is sin. We love it. We love our sin. Jesus, again, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. We loved the darkness of our sin. We, we cherished our sin. It was precious to us. Thanks be to God this morning. He wanted to deal with your sin more than you wanted your sin to be dealt with. He's made a way for us to be redeemed. Well, then what was the price? What was the price of our redemption? Well, the Apostle Peter tells us in his first letter, you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. What was the price of our redemption? Well, it was the precious, precious blood of Jesus Christ. But think about the contrast that, that Peter is making here to, to highlight the cost of redemption. He, he, he doesn't say it was not with a small amount of silver or gold. Rather, he refers to, to what are the, the, the most precious metals as, as perishable. They are in their essence, not in their quantity, inferior to the precious blood of Christ. So it's not that Christ's blood is worth a lot more than these metals. 
It's not comparatively more valuable. It's altogether different. It is altogether of a higher value. It's of an infinitely higher value. And I think, I think we understand this. If I, was to, um, if I was to ask one of you mothers, um, how much can I pay you uh, to, to take your vacuum cleaner? You'd, you'd probably be able to give me a price. You'd be able to put a dollar figure on your vacuum cleaner, and you wouldn't think too much about it. I could buy your vacuum cleaner. But then if I, if I asked you, um, well, what about your wedding ring? Well, then you, you might hesitate a little bit. That, that has some kind of sentimental value to you. But if I, if I was to offer you a million dollars for your wedding ring, then perhaps some of you might be interested. If I was to offer you a hundred million dollars, uh, children, I don't have a hundred million dollars. <laughs> so don't, don't think that. But if I was to offer you a hundred million dollars, well, you'd probably throw your wedding ring at me. You'd, you'd take that for your wedding ring. But then if I was to, to offer even the same amount, even a hundred million dollars for one of your children, well, then you'd probably throw me out of your house, wouldn't you? Because it's a, it's a terrible, appalling thing to put a price on a person's head, especially when that person is your precious child. And so blood, the, the giving of life, is a, is, a, is a great price to pay. And Peter reminds us that the blood by which we were redeemed is none other than the precious, infinitely precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Hebrews 9.22 tells us, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so on the cross, Jesus shed his precious blood to redeem all of his people from their slavery. He bore the full weight of the punishment that each of us deserved. He took all of the Father's holy wrath that we had earned by our sinful rebellion. But this redemption that, that Christ has won for us is, is more than just the forgiveness of sins. It's, it's an abundant redemption. Not only is our sin dealt with, our record is replaced with his. And so every single righteous action that he took whilst he lived here on earth, every temptation that he defeated, every trial that he endured perfectly is credited to us. We get for free what he earned with his whole life. But what is it then that makes this redemption, this marvelous, magnificent redemption so certain? Well, I think there's at least two things. First, look at who it is that does the redeeming. It's, it's God himself, the, the infinite, all-powerful, almighty, sovereign Lord of the universe. He's the one who says, I have redeemed you. The God who knows every star and every planet in every single galaxy because he made each one, says, I have redeemed you. The God who controls every tiny subatomic particle, the one who holds everything in place, says, I have redeemed you. The God who determines every single event of history, the one who raises up rulers and casts them down, he's the one who says, I have redeemed you. He's done it all. He's finished the work. And so we, we surely have no need to fear. This redemption could not be more certain. But then second, notice at the end of verse 1, God says, I have called you by name. You are mine. This is not some sort of random, indiscriminate act. This is not Oprah Winfrey saying, you get a car, you get a car, everybody gets a car. That's, that's not what's going on here. No. God calls you by name. Each one of his precious people is called to him by name. And he makes them his own. 
He gives them a new name, as it were. He makes them part of his family. Because of the infinitely valuable work of Jesus Christ, we're adopted into God's own family. We become co-heirs with Christ. He is our awesome older brother. So then, precious child of God, fear not. Fear not. Your redemption is certain. Fear not, God has called you by name. Fear not, you belong to him. But now look at verse 2. I want us to see the certainty of trial. And this, this verse is one of those really puzzling verses that we come across sometimes in Scripture that can be simultaneously incredibly comforting to us, but also utterly terrifying. Incredibly comforting, utterly terrifying. That's what we've got in this verse. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. So notice what God says. He says when. When. Not if. When. When you walk through the waters, when you walk through the fire. That's the terrifying part in this verse. That, that's the certainty of trial. So we've got waters, rivers, fire and flame. And these, these pictures are meant to represent the most terrifying trials, the, the extremes of human suffering. And dear believer, it is taken for granted that you will go through these things. There's, there's no bridge in this verse. There's no boat in this verse. There's no tunnel for you to go underneath these waters. You have to go through them. There's nothing said about putting out the fire or waiting until the, the flame burns down a little bit or the embers begin to cool. No, you have to go through the fire. You have to go through the water. This isn't merely dipping your feet in the waves of trouble. You have to go through them. Not merely warming yourself by the fire. It's through the fire that you have to go. And that fire could well be like, the, like Nebuchadnezzar's furnace when it's heated seven times hotter than usual. So I wonder, dear friend, are you prepared to endure that fiery ordeal because it's certain you might be in it right now can you trust the living God so much that you feel sure that when you get into the midst of that burning fiery furnace he will be with you he'll be the one like the son of man the son of God who will preserve you by his gracious presence. See, God doesn't promise his people any immunity from trouble. In fact, it's completely the opposite. He has foretold that, that they will have trouble. Jesus himself said, in this life, you will have trouble. There's no smooth, royal road to heaven. In fact, one hymn writer puts it like this, the path of sorrow and that path alone leads to the land where sorrow is unknown. So Christian, you will, you will suffer. That much is certain. But it's not without purpose. It's not without hope. It's not without comfort. Listen to how another hymn writer puts it. Taking on the, the, the voice of God. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow, for I will be with thee, thy troubles to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design 
thy dross to consume, and thy gold to refine. Isaiah himself makes it a bit clearer in chapter 48, where God says, I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. Or Zechariah, another Old Testament prophet, he takes up this fire image in Zechariah 13 and verse 9. And God says, I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. So God's purpose in trial is to refine us, to to deepen in us, to bring out more clearly the family likeness to Jesus Christ. He wants to consume the dross of sin that just hangs around in your life. But notice the result. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. And what does God answer? They, the people in the fires of affliction, the people going through this trial, they are my people. And we will say, The Lord is my God. This this is not easy. But the fruit that it produces is so, so worth it. And, And when the Lord brings us through whatever trial we're called to face, and he will, then we will be able to say with Paul, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And this is, this is not because the fire in some way is not hot. It's not because the water doesn't threaten to drown us. No, because in comparison with what God produces in us and for us, the trial really will seem light And momentary. See, God proves to you in trial, through trial, that He is your God. And you know, in a way that you would not have known before, that you are one of His people. And all that He leads you through here on earth is simply preparing you to experience what Paul calls an eternal weight of glory. So one day you will live with him. One day he will wipe away every tear from your eye. One day you'll never cry again. One day there'll be no more trials. One day there'll be no more suffering. So then fear not. Even in the midst of trial, because... There, right there in the, in the eye of the storm, Yahweh, the Lord, is with you. The God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The God of everlasting covenant, he is with you. The one who says to his people, I myself will search for my sheep. And will seek them out as a shepherd seeks his flock when he's among his sheep that have been scattered. So will I seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all places where they've been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. Listen to how Spurgeon drives this home. He says this, One of the worst mistakes we could make would be to judge our condition before God by our outward circumstances. 
Many of God's best servants are rich in faith, but extremely poor in pocket. Strong in the Lord, but sadly weak in the body. Beloved of heaven, but abhorred of the men of the world. Many of those whom the Lord loves most endure sharp affliction, even as the most precious metal is likely to see the most of the fire. Is it not written, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten? What son is there whom his father chasteneth not? The Lord scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Therefore never judge yourselves by outward circumstances, for these are not the balances of the sanctuary and cannot help you to a just conclusion as to your state before God. Everything may seem to go against you, and yet all things are working together for your good. So, beloved, fear not. Trial is certain. Fear not, because in that trial, the Lord will be with you. Fear not, in that certain trial, God has a purpose for you. He's transforming you. He's refining you. Well, look now at the last two verses in our section, verses 3 and 4. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. And so here again, we have words that if they weren't written down for us in black and white, we probably wouldn't believe. Fear not, loved ones. God's love for you is certain. Look here, he's the, the holy one of Israel. The holy one of Israel. This God is a God who cannot lie. And so you're not trusting to one who, after all, is going to repent of all that he promised and not fulfill it. For God is not a man that he should lie or, so, or a son of man, that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? This holiness of God is, is terrifying, terrible to an unreconciled soul, but to, to a heart that is reconciled to God. The, the holiness of God's nature is, is a pledge, a, a, a promise that every single one of his promises shall be kept. And that not one jot or tittle of all that he has guaranteed to his people shall fail to come to them. And then God calls himself your savior. Your savior. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And that's, that's what he did. The eternal son of God, the second person of the Trinity, laid down his life for you, dear believer. He's promised to save you and he will save you. He is your savior. He gives Egypt as your ransom and Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Egypt and Cush and Seba, these were, uh, these were wealthy, powerful nations, but he values you more than them. He loves you more than them, far more. In fact, there's a, there's a historical aspect to this. When Sennacherib was, was poised to attack Jerusalem with all the armies of Syria, he actually has to break away from his plan to attack Jerusalem to, to fight off an army that's encroaching from Egypt and Ethiopia, from Cush. And so Judah is spared, but the armies of Egypt and Ethiopia are swallowed up. And then when he returns to resume his attack on Jerusalem, well, then an angel of the Lord comes down into the camp outside Jerusalem and kills 185,000 of the Assyrian troops. And then Sennacherib goes home without ever actually making it inside the walls of Jerusalem, and he's eventually killed by his own sons. 
But God actually gives you more than this. He gives you more than Egypt or Cush or Seba. Far, far more, as we've seen. He gave his only son as a ransom for you, Christian. We have a reminder of that this morning before us. His broken body and blood. And then we have these astonishing words. God himself tells you, you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. The God of highest heaven, the Lord of all creation, the maker of heaven and earth, Yahweh himself says to you, you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. It reminds me a bit of the the song of Solomon. And there, the the, the central characters are a bridegroom and his bride. And the, the bridegroom represents God and the bride represents the church. And there in the, the Song of Solomon, one of the things the bridegroom says, as he looks upon his bride, he says this, You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. He's talking about you, church. How can, that, how can it be that God can look on broken and flawed and rebellious and sinful people like you and me and declare, you are altogether beautiful. There is no flaw in you. How can he do that? Well, because when he looks at us, when he looks at his church, he sees us as we really are in Christ. He sees us as utterly forgiven, totally cleansed, as having lived as righteously as his own son with with all of his merit. And so he can say truthfully, not using hyperbole, you are beautiful. There is no flaw in you. So, dear saint, fear not. Fear not. God's love for you is certain. You are precious to him. You are his treasure, his beautiful bride. As we finish, I just want us to examine our hearts together. I've got some questions that I hope will will help you do that. And the first question is this. First, have you you seen yourself as Gomer? You know, so often when we read Bible stories, um, we like to think of ourselves as one of the characters in the story. And, And so often we get that utterly wrong. When we read of David and Goliath, we think we're David. That's not true. We're, we're the Israelites quaking in the corner. Some of us might even be the Philistines. We're certainly not David. When we read of Hosea and Gomer, we think we're faithful, patient Hosea, but in actual fact, we're Gomer. And so the question is this morning, do you see your need of a redeemer? Do you know that you're Gomer in that story? Do you see the desperation and devastation of your own sin? Have you cried out to Jesus for him to save you? Have you humbly begged him for forgiveness? Have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? Have you believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Well, if you have, if you know Jesus is your Redeemer, then my question this morning is, have you not proved in your life thus far, over and over, that he has been with you in every trial? He has sustained you. And if the Lord has dealt this way with you up until now, what can you possibly fear for the future? Well, you might say, but I've never been this particular way before. I know you haven't. But God has been with you all the way you've already come. 
and every way you already came was new to you until you came to it. And in everything, the Lord helped you. Why should he not help you now and in the future? You might say, well, there'll be changing circumstances. Well, yes, there will. There will indeed be changing circumstances, but there will not be changing promises. Perhaps you say, well, I'm so changeable myself. I'm so inconstant. Well, that may well be true. But do you find any change in the Lord? That's where your confidence is to be placed, in the Lord, not in yourself. So friends, fear not. Your redemption is certain. Fear not, your trials are certain. But in it and through it all, God's love for you is certain. Let's pray. Father, when we consider these things, we, we have to cry out with the, the psalmist, what is man that you are mindful of him? We're astounded that these things are true of us in Christ Jesus. We pray that you would drive these truths into our hearts, that they would sustain us through whatever this coming week brings that we would know with absolute certainty we are redeemed. That we would know that whatever trial we face, you are with us. And that in that trial, especially in that trial, you love us. You have purposes for us beyond what we can possibly imagine. So please comfort us this morning and sustain us throughout this coming week. If we ask in Jesus' name, amen.